Hi, folks. Hope you guys are doing great. I hope you're enjoying the virtual conference this year. Really wish that we could uh, all be looking at each other face to face, but unfortunately, the circumstances right now, it's just just not possible. But uh, I look forward to next year, and, and I hope that uh, <clears throat> I hope that we're actually able to shake hands and, and talk to each other, or maybe not necessarily shake hands. I don't know. I don't know what the political uh, correct thing is. I just know that this is going to be a great EMS conference and, and conferences in the future are going to be great. Uh, my name is Stephen Rahm. I'm the chief of uh, the Office of Clinical Direction and the co-chair for the Center for Emergency Health Sciences. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're located just northeast of San Antonio, Texas. And in our uh, facility, uh, we do a lot of uh, a lot of research, a lot of uh, product development, um, a lot of teaching, um, critical care, procedural anatomy skills, uh, EKG, um, airway skills, um, you imagine it, we do it. Um, and it's just uh, a real pleasure and honor to be speaking up here uh, for y'all's uh, state conference. Actually, not up here, I'm down here. Um, we're virtually looking at each other. Maybe we'll actually be in some place at the same time sometime eventually. But anyway, the topic here is bundle branch blocks and, uh, and paste rhythms. And I chose this topic because uh, <clears throat> we've had some challenges in the past and, and we continue to when we're looking at a 12 lead that shows a bundle branch block or a, a paced cardiac rhythm, especially when that patient's complaining of chest pain. And we've historically been told that, oh, well, it's a bundle branch block. Specifically, it's a left bundle branch block. You can't diagnose a STEMI or it's a paced rhythm. So don't look any further. Even the machine will tell you bundle branch block or it'll tell you paced rhythm, no further analysis. So the machine is like, I, you know, I'm not even gonna go there. I'm not. Um, so that means it's it's up to us to to have the the clinical acumen as well as the EKG interpretation skills to be able to increase our index of suspicion as to whether or not we think um, that patient could be having underlying MI. Now I should preface this conversation by telling you that I am not insinuating that you start looking at bundle branch blocks in the field and start calling in code hearts or heart alerts or STEMI alerts just because the patient has a left bundle branch block. In fact, we stopped doing that in 2013 and for good reason, because a lot of these folks actually end up not having culprit arteries, end up not going to the cath lab. It's just a left bundle branch block. However, if you look a little bit deeper into that bundle branch block and you apply a, a validated as in proven in science um, system or criteria system, then you can actually unearth some of these MIs in the setting of a left bundle branch block or a paste rhythm. It's up to you to incorporate that into your protocols, into your regional system of care. I'm just gonna show you how it can be done. Now, it sounds easy and, and a lot of times it's actually very straightforward, but as you can imagine like anything in electrocardiography, it can be a little bit challenging. So. So we're going to talk about. First of all, what the heck is a bundle branch block? We're going to describe that and its clinical relevance, right? Um, how do we differentiate a right from a left bundle branch block? Well, it's kind of important, but that's actually really, really straightforward. Can an MI be detected in the presence of a left bundle branch block or a paced rhythm? On the surface, no. You, go, you just skim the surface a little bit and then possibly Yes. So I'm not telling you that this is going to work 100% of the time, but you folks are all here and you're attending this conference to learn and to increase your diagnostic yield. So even though some things that we do in medicine, because that's a common question that, that you get asked, right? Well, how's that going to change my treatment? It's not going to change my treatment. It may not, but it does change the way you think. And our patients need our minds as much as they need our hands. So I, I personally don't accept that excuse of, well, it's not going to change my treatment. But if it changes the way you think as a clinician, then you become better as a result of it. And that could impact the way you change your treatment. So I think this is very relevant. We're going to talk about the Scarboza criteria. What the heck are they? Where do they come from? Who is this Scarboza person? And what do they know anyway? Well, we're going to talk about that. And then finally, how does all of this affect my treatment? And I'll show you exactly how it can affect your treatment. So first and foremost, let's talk about lead placement, okay? Because everything that we're going to talk about from this point forward is predicated on proper lead placement. So many of you that are listening to this today do not normally read EKGs. It's not within your skill set. It's not within your training. But many of you are taught to apply leads and acquire an EKG. It doesn't take a paramedic to put leads on and acquire an EKG. However, if you want an EKG of diagnostic quality, then your leads have to be put, placed correctly. So 
your limb leads. So they're called limb leads, right? I mean, they're not called trunk leads, they're called limb leads. Now, I'm not saying that the limb, the limb leads need to go on the wrists or the ankles. What I am saying is they should go south of the shoulders and south of the hips. So you can put them on the upper arm, you can put them on the forearm, you can put them on the thigh, you can put them on the calf. They just need to go south of the shoulders or south of the hips. A lot of folks um, will, will say, well, I, I put the limb leads on the trunk to reduce artifact. And uh, my response is, if, you're, if you have an artifact, then ask the patient to lay still and then, and then reacquire the tracing again. For, so for diagnostic quality EKG, you really want the limb leads need to be on the limbs. And then your, your precordial lead placement, these are your chest leads. You could take five different people with five different anatomical um, appearances and put the leads on correctly on all five of them and they would all look different. And the reason why it would look different is because they all have one thing in common. You placed your leads based upon anatomy, not the way it looks in a book, not the way you think they need to go. It's because you actually felt the patient's chest and felt their ribs and felt their intercostal spaces and you put the leads where they're supposed to be. Of all of your precordial leads, leads V1 and V2 are notoriously placed too high. And when those two precordial leads are placed too high, that can cause two problems. Number one, it can cause it can cause you to miss something that is relevant, or it could cause you to look at something that's not really there. So either way, it could completely skew your interpretation of that rhythm. So just take the couple of extra seconds. And for those of you that uh, that that put leads on all the time, and maybe you want to train your your support medic to put on leads, just just practice with them. And it's all based upon anatomy. You're looking for intercostal spaces, right? So there was actually a paper that was published back in uh, in 2018. Brooks Walsh found that there actually are clinical consequences. So let me repeat that: clinical consequences of misplacing leads V1 and V2. That means that when we misplace those leads, that could negatively impact our treatment, which means we could potentially cause further harm to the patient. You want a diagnostic quality 12 lead and you want an EKG that's free of artifact. You want a nice data quality so that way you can look and, and finesse and navigate your way through that EKG. So in his study, he found that you can find things like, you know, anterior T wave inversion, Q waves, ST elevation. It can look like the patient's having a PE. Heck, it even shows Brugada syndrome, even though the patient doesn't have Brugada syndrome. What is Brugada syndrome? Well, it's basically a sodium channel abnormality that's associated with sudden cardiac death. So I wouldn't want to look at that and, and think the patient has Brugada syndrome if they really don't. So make sure that you place your leads correctly. This is an example of what not to do. And this was a picture that was texted to me at about two o'clock in the morning from one of our crews. This was on the scene and this was a newer medic. And he sent me this text and he said, Steve, what do you think about my lead placement? To which my reply is, is this a joke? And he replied back and he said, no, actually, I'm on scene with this patient right now. And I'm thinking, why are you talking to me? If anybody, you should be talking to your medical director. And as it turns out, this is after he fixed the leads. This is after he fixed the leads. So leads V1 and V2 place too high way too high. And lead V1 is way too lateral. V1 and V2 should be at the fourth intercostal space on the right and left sternal border, respectively. And then when I came down there and looked at lead V3, and, and in retrospect, I sat down with him, we went over proper lead placement. He's like, man, that, that lead V3 was just, that was not right. I'm like, you weren't, it wasn't. But what it did enable me to do was to come up with my own lead. So now we have a lead WTF. And that's what I called it here. And I named it specifically for this paramedic. Lead V3 is sitting right over the sternum. It's literally sitting right over the sternum. Lead V3 should be equidistant between V2 and V4, which V4, by the way, is way too medial. V4 is placed at the fifth intercostal space in the mid-clavicular line. So V4 is way, way too medial and V3 is way, way too medial. And if you look down here at lead V5, it's also too medial. V5 is placed in the fifth intercostal space in the, in the anterior axillary line. 
This is actually more closely resembling almost midclavicular, a little bit lateral to midclavicular, but it's not even right. And if you look at V6, V6 is also too medial. V6 is placed at the fifth intercostal space on um, in the mid axillary line. So this lead placement was totally jacked up. And I looked at the tracing that he got as a result of it. And it's like, wow, man, I, uh, by, by this strip, your patient should be dead. I mean, it was showing all kinds of weird stuff. So that proved Dr. Walsh's theory that you misplace your leads, you're not gonna get a quality tracing. Our patients deserve a quality EKG tracing because it's from that that we base treatment decisions off of. This is not a, this is not a, uh, a mine or a minor skill or something, you should probably be okay. No, you need to put your leads anatomically. So enough said, we'll quit beating that dead horse. Let's talk about bundle branch blocks. When you're looking at a 12 lead tracing, before you can even entertain the notion that you're looking at a bundle branch block, that rhythm has to meet two prerequisites. First and foremost, it has to be a supraventricular rhythm. In other words, that cardiac rhythm has to have originated from above the level of the ventricles. In other words, it must be either sinus in origin, it could be atrial in origin, or it could be junctional in origin. It just can't originate in the ventricles. You cannot have a bundle branch block with a rhythm that originates in the ventricles. And I literally have three or four tracings at my office that show a wide complex tachycardia. And the machine says left bundle branch block, probable ventricular tachycardia. And I kind of giggle because that's impossible. You cannot have a bundle branch block when the underlying rhythm is ventricular. The underlying rhythm must be supraventricular. So that's one prerequisite. The second one is your QRS width, the duration must be 120 milliseconds or greater. If it doesn't meet both of these criteria, then you're not looking at a bundle branch block. You're looking at something else. So when, when you guys are looking at these strips, those are the first things you're asking yourself when you see something that's wide, right? Looks a little bit wider than usual. Number one is, do I see P waves or do I see any evidence of supraventricular activity? And number two, is that QRS 120 milliseconds or greater? If it meets both of those, then you can go down that bundle branch block path. So let's look at right bundle branch block. So I, I think we could all agree that if electricity originates anywhere up in here and it travels down through the AV node and, and normally undergoes that little physiologic delay, it cut, travels down the common bundle of his and it gets to this point and this point at the exact same time. However, it's blocked right here, which means none of this is going to get activated. It's not going to depolarize. So in a right bundle branch block, the left ventricle depolarizes first. That, that, right bun that block at that right bundle, nothing is going to transmit beyond that block. So that means that the initial wave of electricity is to the left. Your left ventricle depolarizes first. But this is a critical term. The critical term here is terminal force. The question is not where the wave of electricity is going initially, is where it's going terminally. In other words, where it ends up going. And it terminally goes from left to right. And you'll notice I put my leads V1 up here on the left, and I put leads 1 and V6 on the right. So if you'll notice the terminal force or the terminal wave is going away from leads one and V6, but it's coming right toward lead V1. And following the rules of electrical flow, if a camera sees a wave of electricity coming towards it, then the resulting complex is gonna be positively deflected. If that camera or that lead, I often use the term camera and lead synonymously, if that lead sees that wave of electricity going away from it, then the resulting complex is going to be negatively deflected. So in a right bundle branch block, the terminal force of the terminal wave is coming toward V1, which is going to give you a terminal R wave in V1. In other words, whatever configuration of QRS complex you have, and you shouldn't have a QRS in lead V1, it's not whether or not lead V1 is pointed all up or pointed all down, it's whether or not the last wave of that complex is pointed up or down. And in a right bundle branch block, it will be pointed up, giving you a terminal R wave. For the same reason that you get that terminal R wave in V1, you get slurred S waves in leads 1 and V6 because the terminal wave is going away from those two cameras or those two leads. 
So this is what a right bundle branch block would look like. So what I teach my students and anybody that I teach this course to is if you look, so we agree this is a supraventricular rhythm because if I look down here in lead two, I see P waves. So check. If I look up here at the QRS duration, it's greater than 120 milliseconds, so check. So it's met the two base criteria for calling it a bundle branch block. Then I look up there at lead V1. And what I do is I, I find the J point, which is where your, your whole QRS complex re-intersects with the isoelectric line. And then if you draw a horizontal line through the entire complex, the entire complex, and, and, and you're, so you're measuring to the left of the J point, and if the first complete triangle that you make is pointed up, then you have a terminal R wave. And if you look in, in this second complex here, you actually have a tiny, tiny little Q wave, and then you have this terminal R wave. So you basically have a little Q big R or a, a, a Q R wave, but nonetheless, it's a terminal R wave. If you look out in leads V5 and V6, both of those leads terminate with a slurred S wave, because again, that's a reflection of that electrical wave going away from those cameras, the terminal wave going away from those cameras. Here's another right bundle branch block. It just looks a little bit different, but if we follow the same pathway, we will get to the correct answer. So if you look at lead two, you're like, oh, I don't know, is this, uh, I mean, that looks like a P wave, that looks like a P wave, I don't really see one there. Here's the thing, you only need to see P waves in one lead. You don't have to see P waves in every lead. As long as you see P waves in any one lead and all those P waves look the same. So if I come up here to lead V4, I clearly see P waves that all look the same and have the same PR intervals. So I can confidently say this is a supraventricular, it's an underlying sinus rhythm. The QRS is 142 milliseconds. So it's met the base criteria for me to explore the possibility of a bundle branch block. So then I go up to lead V1, I find the J point under a horizontal line through the entire complex, and you'll notice the first complete triangle I make to the left of the J point is pointed up. And this actually is what's called an RSR complex. And that's probably one of the most common configurations that you'll see with a right bundle branch block is an RSR. Sometimes you see an RSR in lead V1, but the QRS is of a normal width. That is simply called an incomplete right bundle branch block. In other words, it has the it has the morphologic criteria. It looks like a right bundle branch block. It's just not wide enough. But nonetheless, this is an RSR, but it terminates in an R wave. And if you look out in leads V1, I'm sorry, leads one and V6, you see these slurred terminal S waves. Here's another right bundle branch block. Again, this one looks yet a little bit different only because it's a different patient, right? If you could run the, you could run the same EKG on the same patient and it would look a little bit different every time. Change your leads and all bets are off. If your leads are not on correctly to begin with, then there are no bets to begin with. So this is just a different looking right bundle branch block. So if I look out here in lead two, I see P waves and those P waves all look the same and the PR intervals are all the same. So the underlying rhythm is a sinus rhythm, it's supraventricular, but my QRS duration is 144 milliseconds. So I'm thinking, okay, so I think I'm looking at a bundle branch block. So if I look up there and lead V1, I've got what is called an R prime. So you see this little initial upstroke and it comes back down, but it never comes down to the isoelectric line, which means that it never formed an S wave. So this is simply called an R prime. And this is where you, you, you hear people talk about bunny ears, right? So this is kind of like a little rabbit ear, but the right rabbit ear is taller than the left. That's a conversation for, for a different day. But if I were to draw a horizontal line through that entire complex, the first complete, in that case, the only complete triangle I make is pointed up. And that gives me a terminal R wave in lead V1. And look at those slurred S waves out there in leads one, and V6. So what's normal for a right bundle branch block, right? So it, it sounds a little weird, but a normally abnormal rhythm. So there are some things that you would expect to see with a right bundle branch block, obviously the, the wider QRS, but if you look in leads V1, V2, and V3, you see some ST segment depression, right? That is a secondary repolarization abnormality you would expect to see that with a right, that's normal for right bundle branch blocks. So much so that if you didn't see ST segment depression, 
And especially if you saw ST elevation, that's not normal for a right bundle branch block. So when you see that right precordial ST depression, just you, you really have learned nothing other than I would expect to see that with a right bundle branch block. So if that's normal for right bundle branch block, this would clearly not be normal for right bundle branch block. So in V1, V2, and V3, there's an underlying bundle branch block and it's a right bundle branch block, but you see ST elevation in V1, V2, and V3. And this patient's clearly having an MI in the setting of a right bundle branch block. So it's important to understand what you would expect to see because if you don't see what you expect to see, then that makes you think, okay, maybe I'm looking at something different, right? Let's talk about left bundle branch block because left bundle branch block has been the thorn in our side, the bane of our existence, and the whole reason why we want to put a bullet in our head when the cardiologist says you can't call an MI in the setting of a left bundle branch block. You can, okay? You just have to know what you're looking for. With a left bundle branch block, Again, if we all agree that an impulse starts somewhere above the ventricles and it gets down through the common bundle of his and it gets to this point and this point at the exact same time, but in this case with a left bundle branch block, depolarization comes to a screeching halt right here, which means that the posterior fascicle and the anterior fascicle or anything distal to that block are not going to get activated. However, depolarization proceeds unimpeded down the right bundle, which means with a left bundle branch block, the right ventricle depolarizes first, unlike with a right bundle branch block where the left ventricle depolarizes first. But that's not the meat and potatoes, right? The meat and potatoes is the terminal force or the terminal wave. And in this case, the terminal wave is going away from lead V1 and it's shifting toward leads one and V6. So when I say terminal wave, I'm not talking about a single pathway of electrical current. I'm talking about direct cell to cell transmission. And that's why your QRS complex gets wider with bundle branch blocks, because in order for that terminal wave to make it from right to left or left to right, it has to literally bounce from cell to cell. And that's, that's not going to be a very rapid depolarization. That's going to cause a, a slower depolarization, which is what widens your QRS complex out. So if your terminal wave is going away from V1, then that would give you a terminal S wave in V1 because the terminal wave is going away from the V1 lead, giving you a negative deflection. But because it's coming toward leads 1 and V6, then you're going to get these big, tall, monomorphic R waves. In, in those leads, leads one, as well as AVL and V6. So if you look at it this way, if, if with a right bundle branch block, you have a terminal R wave in lead V1. With a left bundle branch block, you have a terminal S wave in lead V1. With a right bundle branch block, you have slurred S waves in one and V6. With a left bundle branch block, you have monomorphic R waves in one and V6, as well as lead AVL. So here's a pretty classic, and this is actually a normal left bundle branch block. So if we follow a plan, and this is a key to anything electrocardiographically speaking, always have a plan follow, right? So if I look up here, I see that the QRS is 140 milliseconds. And if I kind of dance around here, I'm like, I don't really see anything that jumps. Oh, wait a minute. Look at lead one, P wave, P wave, P wave. But we really don't see anything, maybe maybe here in AVL. Yeah, I see some P waves in AVL. So the underlying rhythm is sinus. The underlying rhythm is sinus. And the QRS is greater than 120. So now I'm like, okay, let me proceed down the path of bundle branch block. So let me look at lead V1. If I draw a horizontal line to the left of the J point through the entire complex, and the first complete triangle I make is pointed down, I have a terminal S wave. And then if I look in leads 1, AVL and V6, those are those big, tall, monomorphic R waves that I was telling you about. So for the same reason that you get the terminal S wave in V1, you have the monomorphic R waves in 1, AVL, and V6. Another left bundle branch block, if we look up here, the QRS is 122 milliseconds. There are very obvious P waves down here in lead two. So the underlying rhythm is sinus. The QRS is greater than 120. So now we're going down the bundle branch block path. If I put a horizontal line through my J point, through my entire complex and lead V1, the first complete triangle I make to the left of the J point is pointed down. And again, it leads one AVL and V6. I've got these terminal, I'm sorry, these big monomorphic R waves. So another left bundle branch block. Yet another left bundle branch block. The QRS, 
fairly wide, 150 milliseconds. But if I look down here in lead two, I see very clear P waves. I see P waves in multiple leads. So there's no doubt in your mind that the underlying rhythm is sinus. The QRS is wide. So now we're gonna look for lead V1 to help us out. Put a horizontal line to the left of the J point. First complete triangle you make is pointed down. In this case, the only triangle you make is pointed down. And then you have these monomorphic R waves out in leads one, AVL and V6. What about paste rhythms? <clears throat> Most paste rhythms, the pacer wire is embedded in the right ventricle. And if you think about that for a second, so if the pacer wire is implanted in the right ventricle, then the right ventricle is gonna depolarize first. Well, in a left bundle branch block, since the left bundle is blocked, the right ventricle is gonna depolarize first. That's why an RV paste rhythm will assume a left bundle branch block morphology. If you look up here in lead V1, you have a terminal S wave in lead V1. You'd expect that with a left bundle branch block. You would also expect that with a right ventricular paste rhythm. Here's an example of what's called an AV sequential pacemaker or a dual chamber pacemaker. So in this patient, both the atria and the ventricles are being artificially paced. And if you look up here in lead V1, you can see this little pacer spike that's followed by that little tiny P wave. So that pacer spike is stimulating the atria to, to depolarize and therefore contract. And then you see a little bitty pacemaker, oh, I lost my mouse here. You see a little bitty pacemaker spike just before this QRS and that QRS gets wide. But if you look at that, that's a left bundle morphology because it has a terminal S wave in lead V1. Okay, so what is normal for left bundle branch block? Well, we know it's normal for right bundle branch block. It's, you would expect it to be wider than usual. You'd expect an underlying supraventricular rhythm, and you would expect some ST depression in leads V1, V2, and V3. What's normal with left bundle branch block, if you look at this tracing on your, on your screen, you'll notice that wherever the QRS is, and again, I use the term QRS generically because not all of these are QRSs, right? Again, that's a conversation for another day. But if you look at where all the QRSs are pointing, the ST segments are going in the opposite direction. Look up there in lead one. Your QRS complex is going up, but you have ST segment depression. Same thing in lead two. If you look in lead three, your QRS is going down and your ST segments going up. And if you kind of scour all of these leads, Wherever the QRS complexes are going, the ST segments are going in opposite direction. That's normal for left bundle branch block, and that is called QRS ST discordance. Discordance just means disorderly or basically opposite, right? So this is normal. You would expect to see that with a left bundle branch block. The QRSs and the ST segments should be going in opposite directions. Whereas with a right bundle branch block, you had some ST depression in V1, V2, and V3. With a left bundle branch block, you would expect to see ST elevation in those three leads. And this is what has created the problem in the past. A, a left bundle branch block normally has ST elevation. So if this were your next patient, and this patient was complaining of chest pain, you would look at this and you would see that ST elevation and leads V1, V2, and V3. And you would say, this patient meets our STEMI or heart alert criteria. Well, we used to think that. In fact, prior to 2013, if you, if you reference older American Heart Association guidelines for, for cath lab activation, one of the criteria was a new or presumably new left bundle branch block just on, we would call it just on principle because we, we didn't know if that ST elevation was normal for that left bundle branch block or if that was ST elevation as a result of an underlying STEMI. So we were calling all left bundle branch blocks in patients with chest pain MIs. And as it turned out, a lot of people that we were doing that to ended up not going to the cath lab because they weren't having an MI. So QRS ST discordance is normal right precordial ST elevation is normal, which means that no concordance is normal. In other words, if a QRS complex and an ST segment are going in the same direction, that is not normal. Now we would like to normally see QRS ST concordance on a normal EKG, but we're not talking about a normal EKG. We're talking about a left bundle branch block. So when the QRS complex is going up, 
the ST segment should go be going down. But if it's going up as well, that's not normal. If the QRS complex is going down, then the ST segment should be going up. That's normal. But if the QRS complex is going down and the ST segment is going down, that's not normal. So a couple of studies. So this was published back in JAMA in 2007. And in this study, they found that patients with a new or presumably new left bundle branch block had an inordinately high prevalence of false cath lab activations. And in fact, in this study, almost half of these patients had clean coronaries. They did not have a culprit artery. So we were doing false activations in these patients. Now, I think I think for the most part, I, I would tend to say a false activation is, is probably better than a missed activation, but also to be sensitive to the fact that when we activate from the field, there's a lot of resource allocation that has to go on at the hospital. And, and that costs money. And, and, and I realize that, but in the big scheme of things, I think I would rather overcall as opposed to miss something. But nonetheless, it was in, in 2013, that's when the official demotion of left bundle branch block happened. Poor left bundle branch block, just in the setting of that by itself, it's not considered diagnostic of acute MI. And it's at that time in 2013, when all of our heart alert criteria started to change because left bundle branch block by itself was just not a reliable indicator of an underlying acute coronary occlusion. Enter the Scarboza criteria. This was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 1996. Dr. Elena Scarboza and her group basically started uh, looking at patterns of left bundle branch blocks and paced rhythms of patients who came back from the cath lab where they did find a stentable lesion. And she started comparing them. She and her group started comparing them to people who went to the cath lab that didn't have a culprit lesion. And she started finding some differences between those two cohorts of patients. So she's like, we should probably publish our findings. And in 1996, the Scarboza criteria were born. And they consisted of three specific criteria. Well, fast forward to 2012, Dr. Stephen Smith and his group re-looked at the original Scarboza criteria as Elena published them. And as I said, they consisted of three individual criteria. And, and he and his group concluded that the first and second criteria were actually pretty specific. The sensitivity for this is not as high, but the specificity is really, really high, which simply means if the patient doesn't have these findings, they probably aren't having an MI, and that's what specificity is. So we looked at the first two criteria and he said, you know what, those are actually those are actually validating fairly well. It was her third criteria that he kind of looked at because in her paper, what she and her group did not take into account was the rule of proportionality. So in other words, if you had a, an, a, a negative QRS that was 30 millimeters, which would be a huge, huge S wave, and you had five millimeters of ST elevation, well, relative to how big that S wave is, five millimeters really wouldn't be a whole lot. And that's how she originally defined her third criteria, which she called excessive discordance, was any lead in which a QRS and an ST segment are going in the opposite direction if there's more than five millimeters of ST segment deviation, then that patient should probably go to the cath lab. But as I said, she didn't take into account the rule of proportionality. By contrast, if you had an S wave that was only four millimeters deep, then two millimeters of ST elevation would be a lot. So Dr. Smith et al. Pub republished, and this has been validated, it's been known as a Smith modification to the Scarboza criteria, and this is what they look like. So first thing you have to establish is you're looking at a left bundle branch block and the patient needs to be having signs and symptoms of acute coronary syndrome. Left bundle branch block without an impressive patient really hasn't told you much. Just like an impressive patient with a normal EKG really hasn't told you much. We really like to see both of those because let's face it, it just makes our job easier, but patients don't read the book. So in the presence of a left bundle branch block, criteria A, that I just call them A, B, and C, and they are actually assigned point values if you read the literature. If there's any one lead, so so to, to kind of look for this first criteria, you have to kind of kind of to map out V1, V3, and kind of kind of black those out for a second because you're not looking at those initial leads. You're looking for any other lead, 
where you're looking for a QRS complex and an ST segment to be going in the same direction. In other words, you're looking for concordant ST elevation. And if you see that in any one lead except V1, V2, and V3, and it's greater than or equal to one millimeter, that's a very specific finding for an underlying acute coronary occlusion. If you don't see any concordant ST elevation in any other one lead except those right precordials, then you go on to the next criteria. That's where you turn your attention to V1, V2, and V3. Now you're looking for concordant ST depression. In other words, you're looking for a QRS complex and an ST segment that are going in the same direction and they're both going down. So if the QRS was going down and the ST segment was going down, the, the ST segment is now concordant with the QRS. That would not be normal in either leads V1, V2, or V3. You don't need to see it in all three of those. You just need to see it in one or more of those. So that's the second criteria. That's also a fairly specific criteria. The third criteria is the Smith modification. Whereas Dr. Scarboza said, hey, if you look in any one discordant lead, right? Any one lead where a QRS and an ST segment are going in the opposite direction, and if there's greater than five millimeters of ST deviation, then you should pull the trigger. And that's where Dr. Smith said, rule of proportionality. So what he did was he took the amount of ST deviation relative to the size of the R wave or the S wave, whether it's going up or down in at least one discordant lead. And if that ST segment deviation is 25% or greater, in essence, the size of the QRS, then that is how he defines excessive discordance. It is still a fairly specific finding. Honestly, I don't think that, the, that there's any more specific finding than the first criteria. The second criteria is fairly specific. The third criteria is more specific than as was originally written. So when you're looking at these left bundle branch blocks, just take a couple of extra seconds and ask yourself, is this a normal left bundle branch block? If it is, that doesn't, that doesn't rule out an MI. It just means that you can't see that the patient's having one. But if you see any one of these abnormal, abnormal, abnormal findings, then at a minimum, I, in part of my radio report, I would say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm looking at some, some ST depression in V1, V2, and V3 where QRS complexes are going down. And you know that's not normal for a left bundle branch block. And oh, by the way, it's in a patient who's complaining of ischemic chest pain. And let them make the call on their end, them being the receiving facility, because they will get that to a cardiologist and the cardiologist will look at it. They're going to make a decision to the cath lab or not to the cath lab. That's not our decision, but it is our, 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 um, our job to at least provide them with as much information up front as we possibly can. So this is what, the, this is what these, these, uh, these, these uh, complexes would look like. So right here, you notice the QRS complex is going up and the ST segment is going up. So the ST segment is concordant with the QRS. They're both pointed up. And in this example, you see probably about three millimeters of ST elevation. So that would meet the first Scarboza criteria. That's very, very specific finding. That patient in all likelihood has an underlying culprit artery that needs to be fixed. But if you didn't see that in any lead except V1, V2, or V3, and then you looked at leads V1, V2, and V3, and you see here the QRS complex is going down, but the ST segment's also going down. Remember in V1, V2, and V3, you should expect to see a QRS going down and an ST segment going up. That's normal. This is not normal. This means that the QRS and the ST segment are concordant with each other, and that means that that's not a normal left bundle branch block. Then the third criteria, if you look over here, if I measure, if I'm going to call this the J point about right here, there's about four millimeters, three to four millimeters of ST segment elevation. And then if I measure the depth of the S wave, and if this is 25% or greater than this, then that is what's called an, it's called a, um, an, an ST to S ratio that's greater than 0.25. In other words, the ST segment is effectively 25% or greater the depth of that QRS complex. None of these are normal patterns with left bundle branch block.
Here are a couple of examples. And so these are both discordant complexes because the QRSs are going in one direction and the ST segments are going in the opposite direction. So over here on the left, we've got 10 millimeter tall R wave and we have three millimeters of ST segment depression. So three into 10 is 30%. So 30% of that R wave is the equivalent of this ST segment depression, right? Right. Maybe I said that the wrong way around, but nonetheless, it's greater than 25%. So that is excessively discordant. That's not normal. If you look at the example on the right, your QRS is going down, but your ST segment's going up. Now, if you recall in V1, V2, and V3, that's normal. The question is how much is too much? Well, we've got three and a half millimeters of ST elevation and we have a 10 and a half millimeter deep S wave, 3.5 into 10.5, you have a difference of 33%. So both of these meet that third Smith modification because the ST deviation is greater than 25%. And that is more specific than just a generic greater than five millimeters. So let's look at some bundle branch blocks that actually have underlying stimmies. And we're gonna follow these by Scarboza A, Scarboza B, Scarboza C. So first thing we have to ask ourselves, and, and we have to remember, we have to kind of, kind of phase out V1, V2, and V3 just for a second. And we're gonna look for any one lead in which the QRS complexes and the ST segments are all going up. And actually you see it in two leads. You, look, you see it in lead two, your QRS is going up, your ST segment's going up, and you see it down there in lead V6 your QRS is going up and your ST segment's going up. That is QRS, ST, concordance, and that's not normal. So in essence, what I'm saying, folks, is with a left bundle branch block, concordance is a four-letter word. You would expect discordance. So based on that one finding and one finding alone, that meets the most specific Scarboza criteria. That patient needs to go to the cath lab. But wait, there's more. I'm not just gonna look for the first criteria, I'm gonna look for the whole kit and caboodle. So the next thing I look at is leads V1, V2, and V3. And if you'll notice, all three of those leads have a QRS complex that's going down and ST segments that are going down, giving you ST disc, I'm sorry, QRS ST concordance and all three of those right precordial leads. So it meets Scarboza A, it meets Scarboza B, and those are the two most specific findings. But wait, there's more. I'm not gonna stop there. I'm gonna look for any one lead where there's excessive discordance. I'm gonna look for a lead where the QRS is predominantly negative and the QRS is predominantly, po or the ST segment is predominantly up, and I'm gonna look for greater than 25%. And it's kind of hidden in here a little bit, but if you look up here at lead one, you know this QRS is predominantly deflected negative and the ST segment is predominantly deflected positive. One could easily say that that ST elevation is, is roughly about 50% the depth of this S wave right here. So as it turns out, this EKG meets all of the Scarboza criteria, including the Smith modification. Now, Here's a million dollar question. This is your next patient. This is the EKG you're looking at. The patient's complaining of chest pain. Do you pull the trigger in your agency? That I'm gonna leave up to a discussion between you and your agency or you and your region. But I can tell you that protocols around the country, they are starting, this, the paramedics should have already known this. This is not new. This, is, this, is, this has been around for a while. It's just it took a lot of folks to kind of pick up on it and kind of learn it. As you can see, if you just follow a systematic methodical approach as we should be doing with any 12 lead anyway, then you'll be able to pick up these changes. And at least if nothing else, just a phone call and say, hey, this patient meets Scarboza A, B, and C or whatever, one, two, three, whatever you want to call them. And at least you're alerting the receiving facility and you send them the EKG and they're like, oh, we should probably get cardiology involved because we want to minimize, we want to reduce there are two critical time frames in this whole cardiac reperfusion continuum. Number one is first medical contact to balloon. First medical contact is the time that you walk through the door of the patient's house to the time that they have been reperfused in a cath lab. That first medical contact, that falls on us. 
So when we're taking care of patients with these time sensitive diagnoses in the field, you wanna minimize your on scene time to preferably less than 10 minutes. Get these patients off the scene, get them en route to the hospital, avoid time consuming procedures at the scene, say maybe aspirin and maybe oxygen if they're hypoxemic, because we don't give oxygen to everybody anymore. Maybe get your IV access when you're in the back of the moving ambulance. So again, like I said in an earlier presentation, I want this patient to get timely reperfusion from the time we walk through the hospital door, that's when their clock starts ticking. That's where door to, balloon, uh, door to balloon comes into play. And we really wanna shoot for the smallest or shortest turnaround time possible. So this, this man or this woman can go back to their loving family and spend an innumerable amount of holidays with them. Here's another one. So <clears throat> this is telling you it's a left bundle branch block. And I agree, it's a left bundle branch block, but I wouldn't just show you a normal left bundle branch block and say, there's nothing wrong next slide. There's nothing wrong next slide. I wouldn't do that. So there are some abnormals here, abnormal findings. So the first thing I would look for is I'm gonna start at the top. So is this truly a left bundle branch block? Well, the QRS is 148 milliseconds. And I see, yeah, it's kind of scratchy there, uh, kind of scratchy. There. Oh, there's a P wave. There's a P wave. There's a P wave. There's a P wave. So the underlying rhythm is sinus and origin. So the underlying rhythm is sinus rhythm. The QRS is greater than 120. So there's a left bundle branch block. And let's just say for the sake of this discussion, the patient's complaining of chest pain. So now I'm going to look at that left bundle branch block. I'm going to phase out V1, V2, and V3 for just a moment. And I'm going to ask myself, is there any one lead in which the QRS complex and the ST segment are going in the same direction? And if you look around, you can't say that there is. If you look down here in lead V6, the QRS complex is going up, but the, the ST segment is isoelectric. So I have learned nothing from that. If that QRS was up and there was an ST elevation, then it would have met the first Scarboza criteria. So I really have not learned anything from lead V6. And aside of that lead, I don't see any other lead on here where I see a QRS and an ST segment going in the same direction. So I, I think it doesn't meet Scarboza A. So then I turn my attention to V1, V2, and V3. I'm looking for QRS complexes to be going down, which they all are, but I'm looking for some ST depression. And if you look at lead V2, the QRS complex is going down, <clears throat> excuse me, and there's some ST depression right here. That's not normal. So your patient meets the second Scarboza criteria. They have concordant ST depression in one or more of those right precordial leads, V1, V2, and V3. So that finding is making me think mm, this patient's having an MI, okay? But wait, there's more. I'm not gonna stop there. I'm gonna go through the whole criteria. So the next thing I'm looking for is excessive discordance. In other words, is the amount of ST elevation in any one discordant lead 25% or greater the size of the QRS complex? And as it turns out, you see it in multiple leads. If you look down here in lead three, here's your J point. This is all ST elevation and your S wave is not really that deep. So it's basically about 50% the depth of your S wave. I could say the same thing about lead two. I could say the same thing about lead AVF. I could say the same thing about lead AVL because AVL is also discordant because the QRS complex is going up, but the ST segment's going down. But if I measure that ST deviation, that's easily greater than 25% the height of that R wave. So as it turns out, this patient had a 100% right coronary artery occlusion. So if I back this cath picture out of here for a second, how do we know it's a right coronary artery occlusion? Well, I gave a presentation on STEMI recognition. So we obviously see ST elevation in 2, 3, and AVF. But if you look at lead three, there's a lot more elevation in lead three than there is in lead two. And if you go to your money lead, lead AVL, there's some very pronounced ST depression. So that pattern is telling me that patient has a right coronary artery occlusion. How does this whole thing work with paced rhythms? Well, remember it's a right ventricular pacer, which means that the right ventricle is gonna depolarize first, 
which means the terminal force is going away from V1, giving you a left bundle morphology, which is why you have the terminal S wave up here in lead V1. So as it turns out, the Scarbosa criteria are transferable to paste rhythms as well. And I'm gonna follow the same exact pathway. Do I see any one lead except V1, V2, and V3, where QRS complexes and ST segments are going in the same direction? And furthermore, if they are, is there greater than or equal to one millimeter of ST elevation? And as you can see, it's in four leads. If you look up there in lead one, the QRS is going up and there's ST elevation. In lead two, the QRS is going up. There's a little bit of ST elevation. Look at that hyperacute T wave in lead B4. That looks more like a shark fin capnographic waveform, if you ask me. But that's a huge hyperacute T wave with a marked amount of of a concordant ST elevation. And you also see it down there in lead five, where your QRS is going up and your ST segment is going up. So this patient meets the first Scarboza criteria. And kind of looking around for other uh, the other components, I don't see any concordant ST depression in V1, V2, and V3, so it doesn't meet the second Scarboza criteria. And then finally, when I look in any discordant lead, I don't see greater than 25% ST deviation from the baseline. If there were, it may be in lead V2 because V2's S wave is a little bit less deep than the S wave in lead V3, but I still got enough information to make me think that this is not a normal paced rhythm. And I think this patient's having an MI. We just unearthed it by looking and following these criteria. Here's another one. So this is a, this is a pacemaker that does not assume a left bundle morphology because you don't have a terminal S wave in lead V1. But remember, the Scarboza criteria are transferable to paste rhythms as well. So I'm going to follow the same plan. Step one, do I see any concordant ST elevation? Do I see any, any complexes except V1, V2, and V3 where the QRS is going up and the ST segment's going up? And I see it in multiple leads, lead one, lead AVL, lead V5, and lead V6. Again, just that one finding tells me this is not behaving like a normal ventricularly paced rhythm. In fact, your, your computer interpretation is just saying electronic ventricular pacemaker. It is not programmed to meet or look for these Scarboza criteria. So if we just kind of, so if, if we recognize a left versus a right bundle branch block, and we know what's normal with right bundle branch block, that being right precordial ST depression, then no amount of ST elevation in V1, V2, or V3 would be normal for a right bundle branch block. With a left bundle branch block, we would expect there to be QRS ST discordance. Where the QRS complexes are going, the ST segment should be going in opposite directions. If they're going in the same direction, then that is not a normal left bundle branch block, and we should probably give it its due regard and look just a little bit closer. Again, do not, do not uh, slow down your treatment. Do not stop dead in your tracks and, and stare at the EKG for five minutes. This is something you should probably be looking for as you're moving the patient to the hospital. Because remember, we still have first medical contact to balloon, and then we have that door to balloon. And common sense would tell us the narrower those time frames are, the earlier that patient gets reperfused, the better the outcome that patient's going to be. Anyway, that is the, uh, the end of this presentation on bundle branch blocks and pace rhythms. You folks have any questions? please feel free to hit me up in the chat box. Here's my contact information. I include both my email address. Um, um, I, I function very, um, probably too much on Twitter, to be quite honest with you, but I'm always putting stuff up there. I'm just retweeting something that's really, really cool. Uh, if you guys are on Twitter, just give me a follow. Otherwise, if you have any questions, if you want to look at some more EKGs, I will share everything I have with you. I have no problem doing that. Just send me an email. I'll be more than happy to send it to you. Folks, thank you so much for your attention. Enjoy the rest of the conference and bye for now. Alan.